I am Abdullah Ahmed Al Naim. I am from Sudan. I grew up in, in north of Khartoum. And uh, growing up in Sudan in the 1950s and 60s, the discourse of an Islamic State and Islam and politics uh, is not only something I grew up with, but also something that shaped my life uh, very much throughout my career. And what I do and how I do it and why I do it is, is influenced by that particular question. Out of that experience, I would concur with the view that we need to revisit the paradigm itself. We need to revisit uh, the nature of the concepts and the structures that are now uh, dominant in talking about Islam, the state, and politics. In my view, I think that we have to understand that uh, a lot has to do with colonialism and the post-colonial and neo-colonial uh, conditions of the region where Muslims live, which is in Africa and um, both so-called Sub-Saharan as well as North Africa and the Middle East, South Asia, all the way to Southeast Asia. All of these regions are post-colonial regions. And the post-coloniality is not only uh, in terms of having emerged out of a colonial experience, but also in terms of how our thinking is shaped by a colonial discourse. A discourse that seeks to justify colonialism in terms of the problematic of our cultures and our traditions as, as backward, as anti-modern, and therefore uh, we are not quite competent to govern ourselves. And unfortunately that discourse is not only uh, in justifying colonialism from the colonial perspective, but also the colonized get to internalize that discourse. And I think that uh, Islamists, so-called, I mean the groups that now throughout this region are calling for an Islamic state uh, or enforcement of Sharia by the state, are in fact internalizing the colonial discourse. And I would say that the whole discourse about Islam and the state and politics at this point is a post-colonial discourse in that it is shaped by the nature of the state as having been very much territorial, hierarchical, bureaucratic institution that emerged in Europe and was transferred and imposed into various regions uh, of Africa and Asia and uh, North and South and Central Asia and so on. And in that respect, uh, it, is, it is shaped by that institution. We have to really understand the way the European concept of the state came to be imposed and also came to be adopted by uh, these peoples, Muslims and others, when they achieved so-called political independence. And for me, therefore, the moment of political independence is not really the full realization of self-determination. It's only just one step in the process that started at that point and continues. And in this respect, I think that the so-called Arab Spring is a, step, a stage uh, in the process of decolonization, in the process of um, self-determination, but could mean a really significant shift in the sort of discourse and objectives uh, that are sought. I don't like very much the term Arab Spring because it tends to imply setting sort of benchmarks by something like the Prague Spring or by East European experiences and to say that, well, okay, this region now is finally coming to join uh, the, 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 the process that you have seen in Eastern, in Eastern Europe and the post-Soviet uh, process. And therefore, uh, you know, as if we are coming back to the reviving the 1990s mode of democratization and liberalization. And it's only just this region's uh, turn in that process. But to me, in fact, I don't like the term because it, this is not something that started in two, three years ago. This something has been going on all along. 
And it is nothing to do with the spring. Actually, the region, parts of these societies don't live in places where there is a spring. After all, where is the spring in Yemen? Uh, where is the spring really in, in Sudan? I mean, where now people are saying, uh, is Sudan going to have its Arab Spring or not? Where are you joining? In fact, we had two already cycles in Sudan in the 1960s, the October uprising, and in the 1980s, the April uprising. And the two experiences have not really taken us out of uh, the quagmire of, of Islam and politics, Islam and the state, uh, in fact, created uh, sharper uh, issues and problems to the extent that the whole country of Sudan has now broken up into two as a result of that uh, confusion. So uh, I would like to think that uh, we should take each society on its own terms, in terms of its own history and context and process. And even the term Arab something is, is also misleading. What is so common about Morocco and Lebanon and Yemen? Um, the, the fact that they speak Arabic of sorts, but they wouldn't understand each other in the Arabic they speak, unless they shift to classical Arabic. Uh, what sort of shared history they have? What sort of demographics and geopolitical factors that, that uh, join them? Really very little. So, okay, so we can maybe, since the people of the region tend to affiliate with something called Arab, uh, pan-Arab, uh, this or the other, culture, religion, Islam, uh, we might use the term, but we should be careful about using it. Now, I think that the, the, the point to me also is that the Islamists um, are, are sort of that assuming that it is just business as usual, that we will just use this opening in, in the politics of the region in order to create uh, these so-called Islamic states to enforce Sharia, ah, as if to say that self-determination is the process we have achieved, now we are free, why don't we go back to? And actually there is nothing to go back to in the terms that they talk about. There has never been an Islamic state in history. So the concept is totally unprecedented and incoherent conceptually and unworkable practically. That it cannot work because you cannot really live uh, in a, a state that is governed by Sharia sort of in a, an honest, systematic, consistent way. And if you are going to be selective about which aspects of Sharia to enforce, what, what, what is the justification in Sharia itself for that selectivity? So I think that uh, we should see the Islamist discourse as part of a post-colonial discourse that is seeking to realize uh, a deeper, a more indigenous decolonization. And as such, it should be allowed to run its course. I don't think that this anxiety about, oh my God, Egypt is turning Islamist, Tunisia is turning Islamist, uh, is really misplaced. It is not the business of the rest of the world how people make choices and what choices they make. We wouldn't dream of telling other people how to, what is the outcome of their elections is supposed to be. Why would you dictate to this region what the outcome should be? Why should we refuse to work with Hamas, for example, in Gaza, having been elected? Uh, if, if we have a principled commitment to democratic constitutional governance, we have to accept uh, if Islamists so-called win elections, let them win, let them rule, why not? This is the choice of the people that, who elected them. And it goes back to Algeria. I think imagine what suffering and destruction could have been avoided if this was allowed to rule. And it is not the end of the world. They will rule and they will fail and there will be other cycles of thinking and reflection based on experience. And I think now with, with uh, President Morsi in Egypt, uh, we are seeing, and the so-called Muslim Brotherhoods are seeing, that it is not that simple. It is not that straightforward. It is not a so-called Brotherhood of Muslims that will be uh, very peaceful and cooperative and so on. No, it will be politics. And politics will be vicious like with any other politics. And that is what we need to have done. I mean, as a Sudanese who have been through this, I say, 
by all means, let them come and let the people see how unworkable it is to live with a so-called Islamic State. Uh, in any case, like it or not, that is what self-determination is. And people will seek it and will insist on it. And in today's globalized conditions, they are more capable of realizing it for themselves, whether the rest of the world like it or not. So instead of wasting energy, and in fact creating very negative uh, sort of discourses and anxieties about Western neo-colonial ambitions in the region, we should really step back and, and let things take their course. We can't change it anyway, we cannot prevent it, and we might as well not try to appear to be doing so, because that is really futile. And the Islamists, I, I, I'm absolutely confident that uh, this project will fail everywhere. Just give it a chance to be applied or so-called attempted to be applied. Why do I say that? Because the concept of an Islamic state is contradictory itself. The state is a political institution that is incapable of having a religion. So whenever we say an Islamic state, what we mean is a state that is controlled by certain elites who will impose their view of Islam. And when we see it in that light, we realize how dangerous it is to concede the possibility. So there is no such thing as an Islamic state, never has been, from the very beginning. The Prophet's experience in Medina, I call it too exceptional to be relevant. By that I mean simply, since for the Sunni and the Shia together actually, there is no possibility of another Prophet after Muhammad, I would say alayhi salatu as a Muslim, since that is the case, there will never be a possibility of reenacting Medina with the Prophet because we don't have Prophets anymore to expect it to come. And since Abu Bakr, it was a political institution, whatever sort of a state there was, and we have to be careful about calling it a state because we tend to assume that the sort of state that Abu Bakr had and Umar and Ali and Usman had in Medina is something similar or really related to what we now call the state. Absolutely no relationship. I mean, totally different institutions in every respect. And therefore, that is the idea to, to say that, well, actually, the state was always political from the very beginning. It was never called an Islamic state by anybody. But religion was always invoked to legitimize political power, as it has been everywhere with every religion. Again, this is not peculiar to Muslims, and it does not make the state Islamic. The state as a political institution does not become Islamic by end. There is no measure, there is no criteria of what Islamic is for the state to be, and there is no way of verifying whether a state is or is not consistent with that criteria. So there is no agreed criteria. What makes a state Islamic? What, what is the quality of Islamicity? that we test, okay, this state achieved 20%, that state achieved 50% of what? There is no agreement on what it is that. Now, when you say that the state will enforce Sharia, Sharia cannot be enforced by the state. Meaning what? Not only that it should not, but it cannot. A norm of Sharia will cease to be a Sharia norm by the very act of enacting it as a state law. That is, when we take, for example, theft and make a crime out of it, the definition of the crime in the statute is what the crime is, not the principles of Sharia, over which Muslims are not agreed. Muslim scholars have not agreed on the definition of any of the crimes, of any of the main principles. There is disagreement everywhere. So which view will you enforce? And once you enforce it by the political will of the state, what makes it Sharia? Can you go back and say, sorry, sorry, I did this wrong, let's go back to what Sharia is, or keep uh, applying Sharia regardless of what the state statute says? So the, the nature of the state, the nature of its positive law, do not allow uh, the possibility of enforcing Sharia as Sharia. Of course, the same conduct can be a crime and a sin. But it is not 
a crime because it's a sin and not a sin because it's a crime. These are totally different concepts based on very different sources. And as such, I think that the illusion of an Islamic state is a mirage. And that the notion of Sharia being enforced by the state is a fallacy. But let people see that if they need to see it in practice. So I celebrate the recent events and I hope they will take us beyond the post-colonial discourse once and for all. Colonialism is part of our history but doesn't have to be part of our future. And when we decolonize our minds, as Malik bin Nabi would say, uh, we, then we can decolonize our societies and our territories and states and join the international community as equal partners in building human rights institutions, uh, peace and security institutions, international collaboration, all of that is our uh, future and entitlement. All we need to do and keep doing is to assert who we are and to challenge ourselves on our assumptions about Islam and the state and politics. Stop uh, deploying and applying retroactively a colonial discourse about Islam and think of Islamic history on its own terms as it resonates with us as Muslims. And that is our obligation as Muslim intellectuals, Muslim scholars of the field to bring these questions and these understandings to the table. Thank you very much.